For the last four decades, Studs Terkel has been perfecting the art of conversation. He was born in New York City in 1912, but was raised in Chicago and made the city his lifelong home. Trained as a lawyer, he briefly flirted with acting and television, but ultimately settled on a life in radio. In the 1950s, he developed an hour-long radio program on Chicago station WFMT, which would come to define him as the voice of that city. In 1967, he published Division Street America, the first of his oral histories, which would chronicle the plight of ordinary Americans. Subsequent books focused on issues such as working, race, and the American dream. His eight oral histories have won him both the Pulitzer Prize in 1985 for the Good War and Oral History of World War II and a National Humanities Medal in 1997. This week, he's being honored with the Polk Career Award given by Long Island University. I am pleased to have him on this program again. Welcome back. Thank Welcome. you, Charles. A long Thank time since we first met years ago. I know. You just reminded me, 25 years ago. You were working Six. with Bill Moyers at the time. That's right. Yeah, I do. I remember. And, and uh, you look like you're in going strong and I'm looking falling great apart. Shape. No, falling apart. Falling apart. Yeah. Uh, a small note, my, my sense of, of condolences, for the, I know, for the loss of your wife, which was you very much. so close to you and meant so much to you and was Thank such you. a partner for you. Uh, after that, you felt like the work was the only way to get your bearings and to... Well, of course, work is what it's all about. Love it? and work is... Yeah, the book, Working, for example. Uh, you know, Freud said in Civilization and its Discontents, the two prime impulses of man, of the human being, is Leben, Leben Arbeit, love and work, love being sex, of course. Well, many books written about that, more than we need, but very few about work at the time. And so working, of course, is the other prime impulse. And so more or less work is what it's all about. I'm a workaholic, I suppose. They say retirement to me. I'm, I'll be hitting 88 May 16th. And retirement, well, I feel like a hero of the Virginian. Remember, Trampus development called him a name, and he said, when you say that, smile. When you say, Stud, you're retiring. When you say that, smile. No, toes up is when I'll retire. <laughs> this book, I, I, I want to talk about, well, I'll, I'll talk first. Yeah. You're being oh, given an award by LIU. That's a rather impressive award out there. I mean, do these awards mean something to you? Well, it's pleasant. It's ego bolstering, I suppose. This is George Polk Award. Polk yeah, was that remarkable journalist who was killed mysteriously. In Greece. In Greece. And uh, you and Mike Wallace are going to share the stage out there and talk about the art of conversation and the interview. And Tonight, and, I hope so, yeah. That'll be nice. And, yeah, a Review a lifetime of, of interviewing. What's that? Review a lifetime of interviewing. That's what it'll be. Both. I, we're two different worlds, and yet our wavelength is similar as yours is to find out, you know, let's pursue that holy grail we call truth, or what we hope is the truth, what we think is the truth. And basically, that's what it's about. You worry, though, I know this from, from you, you worry about journalism today, journalism, because you believe that, you know, there's too much corporate consolidation and corporate ownership. There's that, and of course, trivia has become it, too. It's, I think corporate consolidation and trivia go hand in hand. It keeps us away. You did a program on the CIA uncovering recently. Right. And the role it played in overthrowing Mo Sadegh, a yeah. legal elected guy in, in uh, Iran way back that eventually the gave us the Ayatollah for, via the Shah. Well, the, today it's being covered. We knew then, Quentin Roosevelt, you recall, was proud of the son of Teddy, was yeah. proud of he headed that mission. Right. To Kermit, overthrow Kermit a legally elected government. Kermit Roosevelt. Yeah. And it's, Kermit Roosevelt, I'm sorry, Kermit Roosevelt. And then we did the same thing in Guatemala with Jacob Arabian, right. was legally elected. So we do these things, and we, we've known that for a long time now, I bet if it comes out. Yeah, but your point is that it comes out later when, when you reporters, betcha. we you should betcha. have known about it at the time, or what, what do you, what's your point? I think, I think there was a hesitancy on the part of uh, media, the establishment media. Yeah, when you say it's in the hands of fewer and fewer, well, think about it now. It's in publishing, it's in the press, it's in TV. Who owns CBS? Uh, Westinghouse. Who owns NBC? General Electric. Who owns ABC? Disney. Need we mention our Australian troglodyte, Murdoch? Yeah. So there you have it, you see. So if it's sifted through, we don't, now we finally get bits here and there. I'm delighted about what happened in the streets of Seattle. Oh, I'm delighted what happened in Washington, D.C. Why student, are you delighted? The students, because suddenly the students, to me, seem like 
dormant for a long time, ever since Reagan was in. Before that, there were the 60s, which I find as a put upon areas, maligned, much maligned. The 60s. the 60s was the one moment Young had causes outside themselves, outside of making the big buck. There was civil rights, anti-Vietnam War, they had causes. Women. Then came making the big bucks. And now the kids have a cause again, it seems, on campus. They work with the sweatshop uh, but, conditions. But, but, but characterize what you think their cause is. The they, cause? To put them on the streets in Seattle and put them on the streets in Washington. How would you characterize their cause? I would say it's a combination It's interesting. Teamsters, there's been a coalition now, unlikely back in the 60s. For example, you have the AFLCO Teamsters with the kids. Now, the kids I know made front page, some of the flaky kids did, but the fact is they represented, the others represented something that's missing, a sense of ethics, a sense of morality, connected with, good, the, with the good life. They're not condemning the global economy as such, yeah. but it's how it's used. Well, that, that's right, they're not. That's they're they're basically about. saying, with all this talk about globalization and all that it's done for people around the world, you know, do we know and are we asking ourselves, what is it doing? Uh, what's it really doing to reach out to those who are... Well, William Grider touches on this, a wonderful journalist I hope you have on someday. William Grider. Frequently. Uh, several and, times he writes. He hits this very often. First for the Rolling Stone and now for the Nation that's Magazine. That's the guy. <laughs> well, he hits it right on the button. You know, unless changes on may recognize that this decent pay should be in all these sweatshop joints all over and the rights yes. of those who are dispossessed to be less dispossessed tell me possessed. the story yes sir. Uh, this is a story from your life yes sir uh, you're, you're on a you're waiting at the bus stop oh yeah and there's a guy there who is all natalie dressed oh, about like i am here now he's got this, his finest sometime, suit on and his, his lady is with him and she's got her finest suit on Sometimes anecdotes are very telling. Now, as you can see, I talk a lot. I'm a case of, I have a case of Lagaria. <laughs> Only one guy tops me in Lagaria, and that was the late Hubert Horatio Humphrey. <laughs> yes, he could. That's and so right. I talk to myself. I don't drive a car. Linda, John, Linda Johnson used to say about Hubert Humphrey, he had the fastest connection between his brain and his tongue of any man he'd ever met. Who? Johnson said that about Humphrey. Well, he's right. Yeah. Of course, well, except that I'm pretty close to that when it comes to Lagaria. So uh, sometimes... When I'm waiting for the bus, I, if no one's there, I talk to myself. <laughs> and I find the audience very appreciative. <laughs> and so, I'm, but I can't crack this couple. People know me, you know, on, yeah. on the street. In Chicago. I talk, and this one couple, very handsome, he's Brooks Brothers and has the Wall Street Journal under his arm. Right. And she's devastating, a looker, you know. Uh, Neiman Marcus clothes. She's got the Vanity Fair, of course. Yeah. And I can't crack him. My ego is affronted. So I say, Labor Day coming up. You know, the bus is late and coming. The last, he turns and looks at me as there was no old coward looking at a speck on a cuff like that. He turns away. Now my challenge. But does he recognize you yet? Well, yes, you know, sort of a goofy old gaffer right. who talks a lot, but not much respect, you know. And so he turns away, and now the imp of the perverse has me on the hip, and I want to say. So I say, I know it's going to get him mad, bustling in. We used to march on Michigan Boulevard, banners high, UAW, CIO, solidarity forever. He turns back to me and says, we despise unions. I say, oh boy, I got a pigeon here. <laughs> and there's no bus. <laughs> and so I say to him, yes, you now I'm the ancient mariner. <laughs> yes. I'm fixing with my glittering eye. You're, you're and I honed say, in on your target. Yeah, I say, uh, how many hours a day do you work? It's a non sequitur. He's going, he's eight. How come you don't work 18 hours a day? I take a step closer to him. Your great Crammers worked 18. Now, you know why? Because four guys got hanged in Chicago fighting for the eight-hour day for you. I refer to something that happened in 1886, the Haymarket hey, Affair. Right. Yeah. And then by this time, he's against the mailbox. You know, I, he can't get away. And she's trembling a little, drops the Vanity Fair. And I'm very courtly, so I pick it up and hand it to her. And then I say, how many hours a week do you work? And he says, 40. And now he's sure there's an old nut here, you know. And the bus is not coming. I said, you know why you work 40 hours and not 80 hours where well, your great-grandparents did? Because men and women got their heads busted back in the 30s fighting for the 40-hour day for you. This time they get on the bus. I never see them again. But to this day, I'll bet they're in that condominium that faces the bus stop, upscale one, 35th floor or so. Every day she's looking out the window and he says, is that old nut still down there? <laughs> Well, how do you, I can't blame them, because what does the media tell us about labor all these years? Yeah. Think of the, there's a, 
feature section. I'm not by Wall Street Journal, all the papers, New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Washington Post. There's a feature section, sports section, uh, style section, entertainment section, business section. Is there a labor section? Of course not. So how would they know? That's what I mean when I call it a national Alzheimer's disease, no memory of yesterday. Mm. The role labor did play in all these things. Speaking of that contact, who are your heroes? Here in Chicago, well, everywhere. Well, no, Cla well, well, Clarence generally. Darrow Clarence was one Darrow of my heroes. Well, Darrow, Clarence of course. Darrow. That's where I went to law school. I dreamed of Clarence oh, Darrow. Oh, you wanted to be Clarence Darrow. And I walked up to Julius Hoffman. You know, for the young don't know, Julius Hoffman was that judge in the conspiracy, right, right, right. kind of a comic judge. The guy who presided over the, the uh, Chicago Conspiracy, Senate. Conspiracy, yeah, right. yeah. And so I was not, it was not for me. I wasn't. So I became an actor by accident. I yeah. was a gangster in radio soap operas. Always the gangster. Whether it be Mary Marlin, who suffered more than St. Teresa ever did, Monday through Fridays, courtesy <laughs> of Oxford. <laughs> Helen Trent, subtitle, Can a Woman Find yeah. Love After 35? So I was a gangster in all those. And when did you start doing the oral histories? And why did you well, start? Well, that was accidental. It's, I was interviewing people on this radio station, WFMT. Originally, there were singers, jazz men, folk singers, and the book called The Spectator. And those people mm -hmm. in the book occasionally interview someone like Buster Keaton, who passed through town, yeah. or Carol Channing. Who Marlon Brando. Or Marlon Brando, or too, who didn't want to talk about his work. So he asked me what I do, and so it became sort of a duel. And it's rather interesting, I thought. And uh, uh, let me get back to that, but stay sure. with me. We'll come back to this All book right, and who's sure. in here. But go ahead, help me understand how you went from that to oral history, which has defined you and won you a Pulitzer Prize. Well, it happens to a man named Andre Schifrin, publisher of Pantheon Books at the time. Right. And he was forced out when, when uh, the, millionaire, the millionaire took over, which is named Newhouse, right. took over because he wasn't making enough money. But it was a classy thing. And he formed his own new press. One day he called me up. He saw some of my interviews of Brando for one, of Bertrand Russell for another, of Fellini for another. He saw these interviews and he says, how about you doing a book about, about a big city, Chicago, and what's happening in the 60s? Because he had put out a book about China and what happened to a small town in China after the revolution. And I said, you out of your mind? So I did Division Street America, and it turns out well. Then he says, how about a book about the Great Depression? Young don't know about it. I said, you out of your mind? <laughs> and he speaks very softly to me. And so he convinced me about it. That's how it came about, yeah. accidental. And did you won the Pulitzer for the good war? Yeah. yeah. And then, I guess, the uh, National Book Award lifetime yeah. thing. Right. Now, are you surprised by the enormous success of Brokaw's book? Tom Brokaw's book on World War II? The well, it was good. Greatest, the great, greatest generation? Well, I guess that particular moment, that era he talks about, is the one that's in, in uh, the good war to a great extent, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's, I think people are hungry for something, a cause. And basically, there was a cause. There were several causes. The Depression, of course, fighting that. And big government, that's one of the ironies. Those who must condemn big government, as Molly Ivins would say, Texas. Yeah, big government. Yeah, right. Big government are the ones whose daddies and granddaddies' asses were saved by big government during the Great Depression. Or, in fact, they went to school on the GI Bill. Of course. The story that there are lots of stories about yeah. this, but but the notion of you being sort of the poet of the working man and woman in America. I mean, you in a sense I, have given power microphones to their eloquence. How do you find it? You sit down with them and, and they, accidental. At sometimes I word of mouth. I know I need certain people for the book on working people who work in various jobs, whether yeah. it's park not attendant, a school teacher, a housewife. But sometimes, I got called one day on the radio show, bawled out by this listener. I think it involved race. She said, oh, it's easy for you to say, you sound like my mother. I said, what's your mother's phone number? And the mother turned to me, a woman named Elizabeth Chapin, a marvelous <laughs> character in the first book. It's accidental. And she was wonderful talking about Chicago. Yeah. Sometimes, I was leaving an Appalachian. Uh, many Appalachians came to Chicago from the Deep South, as African Americans did, to work in the steel mills and stockyards. And so, it's an Appalachian community in Chicago. I'm leaving the store. The rain is coming down heavily. I luckily I get the cab, and I have a heavy tape recorder, you were at the time. And the young driver says, you a journalist or something? I said, oh, sort of. He says, did you see the movie Lord Jim? It's Joseph Conrad novel with, with Peter O'Toole. I says, yeah. And he says, it's about me. 
I was a coward, but now I'm, I'm strong. That's why I joined the John Birch Society. So I said, I gotta get this guy, you know, because so I tell him what I'm doing. So we spent, he and I spent two, three days together. What I found out was astonishing. It's not all one dimensional. Even though he was crazily right wing and all this, and he'd kill anybody who was called red. At the same time, he backed Florence Scala, a friend of mine for Alderman. Wonderful woman, ran. he's one of the strongest backers. Yeah. And he, he was kicked out as a prison guard because he fraternized with the prison, mostly black, sympathetic with him. It's the same kind of guy. So there's no rule of thumb anymore about people and labels. I don't like labels anymore, liberal concern. I like issues and individuals and what they do, and mostly sense of community, which I think is the key. This book, The Spectator Stud Circle, uh, talk about movies and plays with those who make my pleasure to have you back Thank on this program, much. sir. It's great. My pleasure. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> it's just, I, whenever I'm here with you, I think of all these stories, so I thank <laughs> you. Studs Turkle, we'll be back. Stay with us.